So Lincoln Riley said he was not going to LSU, and then it was announced he was going to USC. He goes 11-3 and three in his first season with the Trojans, has Caleb Williams with him, and has yet another Lincoln Riley Heisman Trophy winner as Williams takes home the stiff arm statue. They made it to the Pac-12 title game, but a hamstring and the inability to get a couple stops kept USC from winning the Pac-12 title as they fell to Utah so Lincoln Riley, after year one, are we feeling better, worse, or the same? Same. Did exactly what we thought he was going to do, and I still think he's going to continue doing what he was. He had a Heisman-winning quarterback, a very good offense, a very good football team that went from winning only four games, which is far fewer than it ever should have been winning with the talent it had on that roster, got him to the Pac-12 championship, lost, lost the bowl game. But – like, that's what we think Lincoln Riley's going to do. He had USC competing for a playoff berth. He had USC competing for a Pac-12 title. That's what they hired him for, and that's what I expected would happen. So I feel the same. Agreed. Same. Legitimate top five, top ten level coach. Good recruiter. At the most important position, he finds guys and develops them, and that's quarterback. Caleb Williams is obviously a stud. Caleb's like, yeah, I want to keep playing for this guy like imagine how good oklahoma is if they have caleb williams last year right like that, that guy is like like a probably a two-win player above replacement and he got him to come out there nice recruiting class strong work again in the portal did better job this year defensively on that side i i, I feel like they feel really happy with lincoln riley hire it's not better not better than, than you than you felt yeah like how could I, it be? I I was gladly over my skis, but the defense was bad. And while Caleb Williams won the Heisman Trophy, the offense turtled up at times. That <laughs> offense, and look, first year head coach, you've got all that transfer talent. To be fair is to acknowledge that when you go on the road early in the season, you might have some struggles. But things got a little dicey for the Trojans at times throughout that season. And of course, the inability to beat Utah going 0-2 to the Utes. I, for me to say better, they would have had to they they would have had to almost make the college football playoff maybe with one less loss um but i think that i am ultimately same where i probably am walking away from year 1 with a little bit more concern than i was going into last year where going into last year i was like Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams, are you kidding? USC playoff? Like this is it. This is all what we've all been waiting for. I thought it would be easier and maybe that is naivete on my part. But I, I do not feel better. I feel the same. I mean, yeah, not worse. I, I think that's fair. Uh, it'll be interesting if we do this exercise next year because I feel like there will be some pressure on this year to play somewhat better defensively and to make the college ball playoff, or, or or we will look back and say like, "Wow, Caleb Williams is as good as any quarterback we've seen in the last like decade or so," and they didn't make the playoff. In, well, in, I in what's considered to be kind of a weaker league, although I, I think the Pac-12 is pretty good. I have already said USC will be in the playoff this year, so keep that in mind next year. If we do do this again, if USC makes the playoff, and I say I feel the same, I'm not hating. I'm just telling you I already said that was going to happen a year ahead of time. So, boom, there we go. I see Georgia fans in the chat uh, hating on uh, the take of Bear Alexander and making fun of him for a high-character kid. It, Georgia have a, a real, real clean record of defensive tackles recently. Like, do we think character matters for defensive tackle play? I, I, I don't think so. Georgia fans sit down on that one. I, I, that's that's not, that ain't it. Yeah, the college football playoff is USC, Texas, Florida State, and Georgia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody's back playoff. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's Big turn riots. let's turn our attention to. Big Ten Seattle. doesn't need the playoff. We fine. Yeah, we the Big Ten Championship money. is the greatest honor that could ever be yeah. bestowed on any college football coach or player. Exactly. Uh, let's turn our attention to Seattle, where Kalen DeBoer went 11-2 and two in his first season. Now, Kalen DeBoer, coming from Fresno State, um, was his offensive coordinator year at Indiana was as good as Indiana's offense has been in the last couple of seasons um, at Fresno State. Obviously, he was... Uh, very good, you know, with there with uh, with Jake Hayner. And now he arrives. He gets Michael Penix to come in. The offense is explosive. Penix has a tremendous year. The defense still retains a little bit of that nastiness, even though you've got that offensive coordinator taking over for the defensive coordinator. Are we feeling better, worse, or the same about Kalen DeBoer, bud? I think you got to feel better because you knew that he had done it at the lower level. 
then you knew he had done it at the G5 level. And there is a, always kind of a question, would it translate? Uh, and yes, it, it translated really well. This is another guy that I think is going to be a very high floor coach because he runs the offense and like, offense is something you can scheme more than you can, more than you can scheme defense. That's more within your control as a coach. And they're going to score points pretty much every year. I feel like they should be really good again this year. Getting that first big time year can help you a lot in recruiting. We'll have to see if that continues to help him, but Kalen DeBoer kind of hit the like the absolute peak of what we thought he could potentially do based on w his priors, and so I, I'm I'm certainly higher because he's shown he could do it at that level. Yeah, I, I'm with you, but I'm I'm better on this one because like I did not see eleven and two coming. I thought it was an interesting oh. hire. I thought it was a smart hire, and I was interested to see if it would work. Like there were concerns, you know, Chris Peterson clearly took that program to a level where it reached the college football playoff. And that was the highest that it had been in a long time. And then the Jimmy Lake hire happens and that clearly goes poorly. And then DeBoer comes in and it's like, all right, well, let's see what the actual ceiling of this program is. So for him to get to 11 and two, be competing for a PAC 12 title in his very first year, like, obviously we have to see how he does in year two, if he can maintain that, but still based on where I was last year, it was like, all right, let's see. Now I'm at, oh, okay, no, this is going to work. So obviously better. We've got a lot of talent coming back, and it's not just yeah. Michael Phoenix. Like this yeah. Washington roster is loaded. Do you, but I'm better, by the way, unquestionably better um, than I thought before. Do you believe in Washington having all the necessary ingredients to, to not just rule its own neighborhood, but compete at the highest level nationally? No. There, there's there's no real reason to think that they can play defense that, at that level. Well, their defense. They've produced. Here's the thing. Like Washington, if you look at that program over the last few years, since the Peterson era and even into the late Sark era, they, they've they produced really good defensive players. It's yeah, just the personnel it's one or two. Out. But yeah. it's one or two. It's not a team of 11, which is what the national title teams have. They have 11 really good or, you know, nine or 10 really good defensive players. Washington just on the trenches, like for every Vita Vea, there are like 20 pretty average-ish guys. And defense correlates very like a little bit stronger with recruiting rankings. So you can scheme your way to points more than you can scheme your way to stops. Is what defense wins say. recruiting rankings and recruiting rankings win championships. So there Basically. you go. Defense wins championships. Yeah. I, I mean, like, recent national champions are having like 10 or 11 top 50 picks within the next two drafts. I don't mm -hmm. think that Washington is at that level up and down the lineup, but they could run good and win the Pac-12. I mean, they're – what are their yeah, roadies? Like, like, I mean, Oregon when, when State, USC, USC, Stanford, Arizona. I think if, you're, if, if you look at Washington, like when USC and UCLA leave, Washington is in a very good spot to be one of the dominant programs in the Pac-12. Like, I think that is something they can do with ease. Them and Oregon could rule that conference right. if they want to. But as far as competing for national titles, especially in the 12-team playoff, when they're probably going to have to win three games to get that title, no. Because the – Kalen DeBoer seems like the right coach. Yes. And there is a lot of – um you know, there's a lot of passion in that area in a way that's almost surprising considering like the metro area of Seattle and Husky Stadium is awesome. And like that thing can be like a really loud, cool environment and has been when Washington has been at its peak. You know, there is a there there is a like you mentioned, Tom, like Washington and Oregon up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, always competing for the Pac-12. Like Kalen, I did not feel that confidence with Jimmy Lake. I do feel that confidence with Kalen DeBoer that that can be something that absolutely happens. I mean, honestly, probably could happen even if USC and UCLA were sticking around for a little bit. Probably yeah. not in the long run, but as cert especially with their with them leaving, now the expectations have changed. Kalen DeBoer, the expectation is Pac-12 championships. Also, I forgot to mention Utah, so I don't want Utah fans mad at me. In the new Pac-12, Washington, Oregon, Utah. Sorry. Well, there you go. Except for they, have, they do win the conference pretty regularly, so we should probably include them in that. Oh, yeah. They're only the two time reigning <laughs> champions. Is everybody done with their coach rankings? By the way, like quick off offhand programming note. Next week, 
the cbssports.com is going to unveil its annual coach rankings. It is every power five coach. They are ranked one through 69. Um, we update our ballots every single year and our ballots are due by the end of the day today. Oh, Tom, oops. Um, oh, there goes the driving yet? range. No. I told you, I was working on my swing. All right, Man. so, so where Cover three have... golf tournaments going to be epic. Where'd uh, you Tom plays? Kyle Whittingham? Bud, where'd you have Kyle Whittingham? Let me see. I got to pull up the spreadsheet that I sent to Adam. Um, I had him very high. Same. I was just shooting him up the list, and all of a sudden, I just realized that I had Kyle Whittingham in a tier with, like, national champions – and the head coaches at some of the biggest programs in the sport. I mean, he's built a program, not a team. And, or, well, maintained a program, I guess, because Irvin did a pretty good job there before him. Um, I had him top 10. Yeah, same. Yeah, he'll probably be in my top 10, too. I have and not started on mine yet. I still need to do my tweaks and shift stuff around, but he is uh, he's in the top tier. He is in my top 10 as well. And look. I, we're not going to give you the rest because that's what we're going to talk about next week. On Monday, we'll talk about some coaches entering the year under pressure. Then Wednesday, in coordination with the release of the full uh, 1 through 25 and 26 through 69 list at cbsports.com, we will share the cumulative results along with our own opinions, our own ballots. So uh, keep your eye out for that. Jake Dickert at Washington State. Now, remember, he took over for Nick Rolovich, but last year was his first full season. The Cougars went 7-6. and six. It wasn't a hire. It was a promotion. But are you feeling better, worse, or the same about the Jake Dickert hire at Washington State? I'm same. Yeah. Tom, go ahead, sir. I, it's just, it's went about as what I expected. Like, Washington State went 7-6, and six, got to a bowl game, kind of carried the momentum that he had that helped him keep the interim gig after having it the year before. But I mean, what are your realistic expectations for what Jake Dickert is going to be able to do at Washington state? It's like seven and six. I'm probably, that's what I'm expecting. That's what he did. So same. that's not to say it can't improve or it won't get worse, but based on what I thought last year, nothing's changed. I, I think Mike Leach kind of colors the perception of this program in, in recent memory, right? Like my, Mike Price, we remember doing some good things in, in the, the 90s and up until the very early 2000s. And he obviously went to two Rose Bowls. But and Mike Price also missed a bowl more than half the time. Right. So, like, that's probably the best coach we've ever had, or him or Leach. So, Leach consistently went to bowls, but, but usually it was, you know, seven, eight wins. They go seven and six. That's a hard job. And I feel like last year, more Pac 12 teams had their, their act together than normal. Right now, granted, like the bottom of the Pac-12 last year was horrendous, so that that is fair to point out. But like Oregon was good, USC was the best UFC that we've seen in USC, and we've seen in a long time. UCLA was legitimately a good football team. Washington had their stuff together for the first time since Chris Peterson. So uh, for them to go seven and six, and they played on the road at Wisconsin, I, I think he did a a fine job um, there. And so I'm I'm kind of same to maybe a little better, right? That's uh, like, I'm, I'm confident that they, that they didn't botch the hire. Right. That's, that's a good thing to say. I, Oh, I'm, I'm, I wrote worse, but Ooh. I'm starting to feel a little bit bad about it, but the worse, and this is my note. It is you feel relatively, worse about your worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do feel worse about worse. It is relatively worse. It is relatively worse because everybody else seems to be going in the upward direction and Washington state in, it appears to be like just kind of humming along. And it is like if Stanford and Cal were to – like if Troy Taylor's hire ends up working out, if Cal ends up finding with Justin Wilcox some sort of, you know, a magic level up your program potion somewhere, like it is only the presence of some of those other programs that – potentially could keep Washington state from falling to the basement that when Oregon is running well, when Washington is running well, when Oregon state is in a very healthy place right now under Jonathan Smith, that so many of these other programs in the PAC 12 appear to be moving forward with a lot of real momentum such that if you're spinning your wheels or if you're just maintaining that you're at risk of falling behind, I am fascinated to see the way that it works out over the next couple of years. And I'm biased by the history of a lot of these you know, a lot of these interims now make him the head coach. Like 
for every Dabo, there's four cases of the guy being fired after three years. Bill Stewart. Mm -hmm. I just, I, th I think that it, it would not surprise me unless there is a, a real spike again, if that thing ends up just sort of maintaining, spinning its wheels. And then if some of those other teams get their act together, they could find themselves in a position where they want to make a change. If everybody in the Pac-12 is operating at peak efficiency, so like everybody has made a good hire, everybody's boosters have, have their stuff together. Washington State is not a top half job. No. Is it in the new Pac-12? So that means it's 10. The so problem is you're all, counting from the you, bottom. UCLA, Washington, top. Oregon, for sure. Utah, for UCLA sure. is That's gone. Four. UCLA is gone. Oh, excuse me. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Utah, so Washington, Washington, Oregon, Oregon, Utah. Like Arizona State, I think, is a better job than Washington State. I bet yeah. you if yes. like coaches would pick that over that. Arizona, potentially, they're kind of similar. Oregon State. Where do you have Washington State in relation to Colorado? Because I think that's the golden decider. We don't know how long Colorado is going to sustain what they're doing in terms of like allowing – like the last staff at Colorado wasn't allowed to take transfers. Now they're taking 70. Like, like mm -hmm. I, I don't know what Colorado – how long is this? Are they doing this for a reality TV show? Or do they actually care about football long term? I, it's a hard one to judge. But if it clicks, like if like it, un, under yeah. the idea that Dion's uh, enhanced the personnel situation clicks, then Colorado jumps Washington State, and now all of a sudden you're start again. I, I think that Washington State could find itself thankful thankful that Stanford and Cal don't have their act together right now, because otherwise you'd be like sitting in a, a very difficult spot. Agreed. It's a hard job. Not really sure how many great candidates they had for the job. I thought the guy did about as good as he could. Um, Interesting. I was just a hater. Yeah, I'm just a hater. I mean, this is as, as somebody, I'm Wazoo hater, Chip Patterson. I'm just. It, it's all of that Washington Homer in me that keeps coming out as I just like get that Apple Cup hate out of my system here on the Cover Three podcast. That would be so awesome if you actually like hated Washington, like, just, uh, like the most unrelated program to you. And that would be actually a good standard. topic. That'd be a good show, like the most random school that you hate. So the that way be a mailbag question. Um, Pullman's Eastern Washington. Yes, it's close to yeah. Idaho. Then. Yeah. yeah, my uh, I've got some the family. Blues. Yeah, I've got some family in Seattle, and they describe two Washingtons politically. I think there's yes. some area outside the triangle that's probably pretty close to Pullman. There's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating spot. All right, let's, uh, let's keep it going with the PAC 12 rounding it out. With... New world order. -ish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a real division of, uh, of, of a lot going on right there. All right. Dan Lanning goes 10 and three in his first year. I mean, he had, they had such a good season. I forgot they got pasted. <laughs> I mean, Oregon got absolutely blasted in the first game of the season. And I kind of forgot about it until I sat down to review this. And of course, you know, credit to the players on that team, the coaching staff, Bo Nix himself, because he ended up having a very, very good season by the end of the year. He will be back for next year. They've had some good recruiting success as well. Are we feeling better, worse, or the same about Dan Lanning? Better. There's always an unknown when a guy has never been a head coach before. Um, you need to be able to recruit a certain way to Oregon. That's a, it's a place that you can recruit well to, but it doesn't recruit itself, right? Like it, it's, there's not a lot of talent around there. Looks like he came in, surveyed the infrastructure, made a couple changes that, that he thought were necessary. I think he made good hires on both sides of the ball. They did a nice job with the transfer portal almost immediately. One of his hires, Kenny Dillingham, got hired away. After just one year, I think he went out and got Will Stein from UTSA, who is one of the, the more prolific OCs in the G5. Um, I I think it's like the only real question here was, could he do it? I think he had shown the, the potential like based on how people talked about him. But until they do it, you don't know, right? Like, like how do you know you don't get a Will Muschamp? And I don't, I don't think Oregon got a Muschamp. So I'm, I'm definitely higher. Same. What? You? What? Uh what? Yeah. Okay, so, hey, we got, we got 14 he's, he's the, sames. He's at the driving range all day, rolls in here. He's, he's wearing a golf hoodie and a golf hat now. Like He's got a golf club in his hand below the desk. Tom, just, the, look, I, 
<laughs> no, first of all, like I did these rankings before I went golfing yesterday. I did them over the weekend. Second of all, I'm not a reactionary goof like you guys, okay? I stick to my guns. I felt the same. That's how I – Oregon did well. I thought they were going to do well. I thought they were a program that was set up well by Mario Cristobal to win games in the Pac-12. Uh, is Tom? All right, I'll, I'll just I'll, – I'll fill in for Tom. Same. Uh, he did exactly the same thing that I thought he would do the, the, the entire time of his tenure, went as I predicted. and. Uh, I thought it was a total ho hum hire when it happened. Like you lost Mario and you made a hire that seemed just fine. And I think I'm better because now it seems inspired. Because the comment, look, a Kirby, assi <clears throat> a Kirby assistant is like a Saban assistant, right? You don't get to know them. Like you, th those dudes are on lockdown. And so I didn't get a good read on Dan Lanning. But Oregon's administration and decision makers clearly, clearly looked like, talked to him, heard his vision for the program. or like, all right, we believe in you. This is the guy. I, I thought that it was just a, I thought it was a just fine hire at the time. And now I think it is a, um, ooh, can I get over my skis? Can I get a little bit too dramatic? Yeah, let's do it. It's a program saving hire by Oregon. Ooh. Yeah, like they were in a high leverage spot. They had the nail of the hire. It was a risky hire because you're going with somebody who has not been a head coach before. And for every Kirby Smart, I can point to you a lot of guys who were just coordinators who actually did not work out because it, it is hard to know how you're going to manage a staff. That's one thing you don't have to do when you're a coordinator. Um, did anybody make a higher jump in your coaching rankings from last year to this year than Dan Lennox? Ooh, probably because immediately all of the um, like no experience guys end up down at the bottom. Just yeah, as I, a, a matter of merit, almost like Kenny Dillingham will be in the 60s, you know, not because I don't think it's a good hire for Arizona State, but because he has not been a head coach. Dan Lanning still has a, a little bit of, you know, he's, he's still got a crawl. You know, still, still a still a crowded list when you're talking about ranking every single Power Five coach, but yeah, I, I would say that Dan Lanning probably ends up making. Uh, I tell you what, Dan Lanning jumped ahead of Sam Pittman. Oh yeah, I yes, um, I, I agree. I, I think he was the my my highest jumper here. I'm looking like uh, without giving it away. Did you move him into the top half of college football coaches based on one year? No, close though. Yeah, I, I'm I'm fairly close to that. Like I, I, like Tom says he's not reactionary. I don't think any of us are, are that reactionary. Like none of us are like, yeah, this guy definitely sucks, or like he's amazing, right? Um, Tom, did you move Dan Landing into your top half of college football coaches? Yeah, probably. I haven't done my ranking yet, but I say it's if I may pick up where I was so graciously left off by my internet connection. Um, he didn't win the Pac-12. He didn't do, he won 10 games, took over a program that was fairly well positioned by Mario Cristobal and did what he should have done with it. Bo Nix had a great season with him. His offensive coordinator also left after the year. So that's going to be interesting to see how that goes in year two after losing your offensive coordinator. I think Oregon's a good program. Oregon did what it's going to do. I haven't changed my opinion. I, I mean, I wouldn't say it got worse. It's probably if I move it a little bit, it gets better. But one fun fact of stat, it was completely unrelated. But it was something I did over the weekend when I wasn't working on my golf swing because I was going to make I was going I was working on a post to make fun of Iowa as far as throwing the ball short of the sticks on third down. But I found out something interesting. Iowa was not the worst team as far as throwing short of the sticks on third down last year. Do you know who was by average? I do. Oregon. Oh, wait. Oh, just on third down. Just on third down. They, they on average, oh, okay. Oregon no, threw the ball. Oregon threw the ball 2.9 yards short of the first down marker on third down. Now, they did a great job of getting the first down anyway, but I just thought that was interesting considering we would make fun of Mario Cristobal's offense being conservative, and they were actually more conservative on third downs as far as th throwing deep shots without him. Okay, so this is like this is why I'm glad we're only doing two, like two conferences today and not trying to pack in the mailbag questions. We can go on tangents like this. Oregon, when it got behind the chains last year, was, was sneaky mid. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like they were not like in live betting situations. If you were watching this and just, if they did not have success on first down, like their drop back passing game, when, when they could not use play action, when the screen stuff wasn't there, they were not good. It's like, I, I get why Bo Nix would come back. I think he's got more value to, uh, to college than he does the NFL based on last year. Like maybe he improves quite a bit. Maybe the receivers get better. Troy Franklin comes back. Um, but like that surprised me a little bit because they had a pretty damn good offensive line, and you would think like drop back, they'd be better. They weren't. Like there was a big gap between their like early down success rate and then if they got behind the chain success rate, they they struggled. So I, I see that as a wide receiver issue, which you know we can reflect. Yeah. Like who who in that room was your certified burner and like contested ball catcher? Well, Troy Franklin was pretty damn good, but like the the, the second guys they had were not you know were not amazing. I think that's fair. It's like when you're throwing short of the sticks is because they can't get open and they got to like hit and turn around. And so um, in- interesting stuff for sure. All right. So same, better, better for Dan Lanning. Better for me, for sure. Same. Better. 